We're going to go to questions. And since no one likes to ask the first question, let's move right on to the second question. Second question, anyone. And for that, you got to walk up to the microphone. And I'm going to stop sharing this so I can actually see you. Um, let me see here. Hang on. Stop share. There we go. All right. Questions, anyone? Hey, how are you? How you doing, Mr. Frank? Good. Um, all right, yes, I have had lots of experience with atheists, and some of the bigger questions I've had I've written down to share with you. The biggest one is the Paleozoic era and the carbon dating of 540 years to 25 million years ago versus the Bible stance of our Earth is 6,000 years old. So when you have things like that, how do you justify the time period and the difference from science to the Bible? Yeah, good question. I think Christians disagree over the age of the universe. Some say it's old, others say it's young. And we could go through a, a, a long um, answer to that. It's all on our YouTube channel, but let me give you the short answer. The short answer is that any dating method that we take is going to make assumptions that we can't prove, okay? Um, like if you're going to say the universe is old, as most scientists will say it is, if you're going to say use... Um, the uh, light from the stars, what are you assuming? You're assuming that the speed of light hasn't changed. Is it a good assumption the speed of light hasn't changed? Yeah, it probably is, why? Because if you change the speed of light, you have to change all the other laws of physics with it. it could God have done that? Yeah, he could have. But again, you're making an assumption you can't prove. If you want to assume the Earth is young, then you have to assume that the account in Genesis is an account with no gaps, and that the days always mean 24 hours, and this was intended to tell us how old the universe is. But if you really want to take a hyper-literal view of Genesis, the heavens and the earth are actually created before the days ever begin. Because what does it say in verse 1? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? Mm -hmm. The days don't begin until verse 3, and then there seems to be a poetic way of saying how the creation took place. And so when people ask me, how old is the universe? I always say, I'm absolutely convinced the universe is at least 59 years old. <laughs> um, actually, it's at least 83, because my mom's 83 now, okay? But <laughs> the point here is, is, this is not a test for orthodoxy. It may be old, it may be young. I think the evidence is better that it's old. But if it's young, I've got no problem with that. Another thing we think, I think we need to do is when we're reading Genesis 1, or any, this is true of any scripture, we have to take ourselves and put ourselves in the mindset of somebody who lived during the time of Moses, right? Because that's who it's written to. The Bible is written for us, but it's not written to us. It's written to the people of the time. We can put ourselves back in the mindset of someone who lived 3,500 years ago, but they can't put themselves in our mindset. So what would some of the questions be of... Um, <clears throat> An Israelite who had just escaped uh, slavery in Egypt. Uh, gee, is Yahweh the true God or is uh, Ra the true God, right? Uh, are we going to make it through this wilderness? Um, what's, am I going to survive? They're not asking how old the universe is, right? That's not their, that's not their, their question. And if you look at some Egyptian uh, creation accounts, some of the Egyptian creation accounts are similar to the Bibles, except the, uh, the people or the, the gods that create the universe are actually inside the universe in the Egyptian story. They're kind of like superheroes, like Thor, right? They're not outside the universe, transcending the universe and creating the universe. They're somehow in it, which seems to make no sense to me. How do you create something? When, when you already have a creation, namely the people in it, right? Or the, the heroes in it, the, the, the gods in it. No, it seems to be that Gen the Genesis 1 creation story is a polemic against these early Egyptian stories about who the true God is, who the true creator is. Yahweh is the true creator. He created all things. He created the heavens and the earth. He's not inside the universe. He created the universe and sustains the universe. 
So what we're trying to do now here, 3,500 years late, later, we're trying to say, okay, is this trying to give us a scientific explanation of how the universe was, and you know, how old the No, it's not trying to do that. That's not the point of it. The point of it is to tell the Egyptians as they've come out of slavery, you're with the right God, you're with the true God. Here it is. This is the true God. Now, it happens to comport with modern science in the sense that there was a beginning. You know, like 100 years ago, most scientists, or 120 years ago, they didn't think the universe had a beginning. They thought it was eternal. The Bible was right from the beginning. It had a beginning. So um, this is not a test for orthodoxy. I can guarantee you when you get to heaven, no one's going to say, or God's not going to say, did you think it was over, young? No, what is he going to say? Did you accept Jesus? That's the point. So let's keep our focus on that. But it is a good question. And by the way, one other thing, radiocarbon dating, even if it's accurate, only goes back to 50,000 years. Okay? It doesn't go back into the millions of years. Okay. I appreciate it. I've got one more question. What is your response or rebuttal when often I'll, I'll hear, Kelly, why in the world would I want to serve a God or be part of a man-made type uh, cult that he would sacrifice his own son if one, he was a living God and say, you know what? I think I'm gonna put all these little people on the earth and I'm gonna go ahead and put my son on this cross and have him beat to death. And that way it'll take everybody else's, you know, shame and bad decisions and put it on one person. What arrogance that there is supposedly a God who wants all these people to glorify him every day. And what arrogance that you would think he wants all these people to give credit for every decision and everything they do. He's like, Kelly, God isn't in you. It's not a part of you. You give him credit for characteristics and decisions that you make. You know, what is your response when people find God to be arrogant, that they want everything and all the glory and everything to be given to him and all the praise and honor? You know, what, what is your response in, in that? Well, first of all, I would say, even if that were true, why would that be wrong? You're assuming a moral standard. When you say that, you're saying God is immoral for being the greatest being ever. Well, why would that be immoral? You're stealing from God to argue against him. You're stealing a moral standard by saying that this God is somehow immoral. Well, God is the ground of morality. If there's no God, there's no objective right or wrong. So claiming that a being is arrogant and that somehow is a, a defect in God, is to assume a moral standard. Well, where are you getting that moral standard from? Okay. But secondly, God does not get benefit from us worshiping him. Oh, what? Yeah, the reason why God wants us to worship him is not for his benefit. He's an infinite being. You can't add to him. You can't take away from him. Who gets the benefit of worship? We do, right? And just like you can't hurt God by cursing him, you can curse God all day. You are not going to hurt him. Why? Because, again, he's an infinite being. Who gets all the detriment of cursing? We do. The reason why God wants us to worship him is not for his benefit. It's for ours. Everybody worships something. If you're not worshiping God, look, there's only two religions in the world at the end of the day. You're either worshiping the creator or you're worshiping some aspect of the creation. Now, many of us will worship our own autonomy or we'll worship sex, money, or power, the big three things that can get us all into trouble, right? We'll worship those things and we'll put them, these, this is what's called idolatry in the modern world, you're putting one of those things over God. And it never works out long-term when you put a temporal thing above an eternal thing, God. In fact, some of us will worship our spouses. You know, it's like that old Tom Cruise movie with Renee, whatever her name was. Oh, you complete me. No, you don't. <laughs> you that. That's stupid. If you're going to say, if you're going to expect your spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend to complete you and fulfill your, your every need, you are setting up yourself and your spouse for disaster. Because no person can be God to you. Only God can. No joke. So, well, thank you. I appreciate it. It's for our benefit, not for God's. And I might also add that if God is the ultimate good being, he deserves our worship, but he doesn't need it. It's for our benefit. I mean, think when you were a young kid and you idolized somebody, say, in sports or something, you wanted to emulate them, right? And if you ever met them, 
you would want to praise them. You would say, oh, I followed you for so long and da 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 right? It just flows naturally from you. You'd want to do that. If you really love someone, you want to give them worth. That's what, where, where worship comes from. It's worth-ship. You feel better doing that. And the same thing is true with the ultimate being. If we give our worth-ship to the ultimate being, we're going to feel better. We're going to be better. All right, sir, thank you. All right, thanks, Gil. Yes, sir. Hello, Dr. Turek. How you doing? I, I just want to, I'm doing fantastic. I just want to say um, I thoroughly love your apologetics talks. I've been following you for years on social media. And because of the Lord working through you in your life, it has really given me an unshakable faith and witnessing to other people and giving them a reason why Christianity is the one true worldview. Thanks, brother. That's what it's all about. Keep it going. Yes, sir. And uh, just uh, one thing, if, if you could, uh, I love your explanation on the Euthyphro dilemma, and I would mm -hmm. love, to, love for the congregation to hear that today. Okay, yeah. The Euthyphro dilemma is sometimes brought up by atheists. It comes from a dialogue in Plato. And when Christians say that, you know, uh, uh, morality comes from God, they will try and give us a dilemma and say, wait a minute. Um, is, is it good because God does it or, um, does God do it because it's good? In other words, if it's good because God does it, it would seem like God is arbitrary, right? He just does stuff and he calls it good. Or does God do it because it's good? In other words, is he looking up to a standard beyond him going, oh, that's good. Okay. I'll do that. And if he does that, then why do you need God? Right? He's just a messenger. He's just saying, oh, that's good. I'm going to do that. And this is supposed to be a dilemma, that God is either arbitrary or there's a standard beyond God that he has to rely on to, to, to say what's good. And so this dilemma is brought forth to Christians and other theists to say you don't even need God for morality, right? Either he's arbitrary or he's looking at a standard beyond him, so why do you need God? Now, the answer to this is that this is not a dilemma. It's not a true dilemma. This is what's called in logic a false dilemma. A true dilemma is you only have two choices, A or non-A, right? A false dilemma is when you might have a third choice, A, B, or maybe there's a C, maybe there's a third option. And in this case, there is a third option. God doesn't look at a standard beyond him and say, oh, that's good, I'll do that. And he's not arbitrary, he doesn't just make up a standard. God is the standard of goodness. His nature is the standard of goodness. So he is true to his own nature. Look, the buck has to stop somewhere, and it stops with God's nature. So he's not looking at a standard beyond him. He's not arbitrary. God himself is the standard of righteousness. So that's the answer to the Euthyphro dilemma. And unfortunately, as you know, the atheists keep coming up with this objection as if it's some knockdown objection to God being the, the standard of morality, and it's not. It's easily, it's easily answered. Thank you, Dr. Turk. I really appreciate it, and uh, God bless. All right. Thanks, brother. Thank you so much. Hey, Mike. Hey, Frank. Um, when I debate people and I talk about Christian morality, particularly America legislating against abortion or gay marriage, homosexuality, inevitably in my debates, people will bring up, well, why should we follow your morality? Why should we follow your quote-unquote theocratic kingdom that you want to impose. And of course, they bring up the First Amendment, separation of church and state, and even if the founding fathers, well, they would say it this way, they allowed for a variety of religions, so why should we follow the Christian morality? So that would be the second thing. Why should we follow the Christian morality, and who are you to impose that? And of course, I use the moral law of God written on the heart, the self-evident truth, but how would you explain that and the whole aspect of the theocratic kingdom? You're trying to impose it upon us. And uh, homosexuality doesn't hurt uh, the other person. In other words, murder, we already legislate against that because it hurts other people. But if two gay people want to get married and uh, they're not harming each other, so what's the, what's the problem? So how would you answer that? Now, we got a lot in there, Mike. Thanks for that easy question. <laughs> how much time do you have? Uh, well, first of all, let's draw a distinction between legislating religion and legislating morality. And nobody, that, or very few people that I know who are Christians are trying to legislate religion. 
Nobody's telling people you have to be part of a certain church. You have to go to a certain church. You have to be a member of a certain church. You have to participate in certain rites and rituals. We're not saying that. What we are saying is we are going to legislate morality, and that's what all laws do. All laws legislate a moral position. They say one behavior is right and the opposite behavior is wrong. So you can't avoid legislating morality. You can avoid legislating religion, right? But you can't avoid legislating morality. Everyone's legislating morality. And someone would say, well, you can't legislate it because it's in the Bible. Then I'd have to say to them, are you telling me we can't have laws against murder, rape, and theft? Because those are there's laws in the Bible against those things. Is that what you're saying? No, just because it just because the Bible agrees with those moral moral prohibitions doesn't mean we can't legislate them. In fact, we're not legislating them because they're in the Bible. We're legislating them in America because they're consistent with the moral law, which comes from the same source as the Bible. Remember, our, our, our Constitution, or I should say our Declaration of Independence, begins in the second paragraph with these words. Um, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men were created and endowed by their government with certain... No, it doesn't say endowed by their government. What does it say? Endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, why is life mentioned first? Because life is the right to all other rights. If you don't have life, you don't have anything. Now, Jefferson and his cohorts did not want to have a national religion, a national church. But they didn't want to have the problem that secularism brings, which is the idea that there's no anchor for morality. So they picked the, the perfect middle option. And the middle option was, we're going to say that our country is founded on God. And so we have objective moral rights, these self-evident truths. But we're not going to have the intolerance that might come along if we had a national church, because they just come from that in England. So they are legislating morality, and they're grounding them in God. But they're not saying that you have to be a part of the church. So everyone's legislating morality. The only question is, whose morality will we legislate? And when people say, don't impose your morality on me, first thing I'm going to say is, well, then why are you imposing your morality on me? Because that's what you're doing right now, right? You're saying I ought not impose ought nots. Yet you're imposing an ought not on me right now by saying I can't impose my ought nots while you're imposing your ought nots on me. Did I say that right? I know that can give you intellectual constipation if you think about it long enough, but that's because it's self-defeating to say you ought not impose ought nots when you're doing it yourself. But probably the better answer is this. When people say don't impose your morality on me, I'll say, this isn't my morality. I did not make this up. I didn't make up the fact that murder is wrong, that rape is wrong, that abortion is wrong, that theft is wrong that men were made for women and women were made for men and the best way to perpetuate and stabilize society, which is the reason the government's involved in marriage to begin with, is to legally recognize the man-woman relationship over every other relationship. I didn't make up any of this. This isn't my morality. This isn't your morality. This just happens to be the morality. The one Thomas Jefferson said was self-evident. So if you don't like the morality, you don't have a problem with me. You have a problem with the creator upon whose nature this morality is derived. So I'm not imposing my morality. I'm imposing the morality, the one our country was founded on. Okay. Now, if you want to get into the details of homosexuality, I have a book called Correct, Not Politically Correct that gets into this. Um, but the point here is, is that the main purpose of marriage, the reason the government uh, for years, for time immemorial, has recognized marriage is not because it's a religious right per se, but because marriage between a man and a woman perpetuates and stabilizes society. It procreates and it brings up children. It creates civilization. No other relationship does that. And that's why the government has privileged the man-woman relationship over every other relationship. The problem, one of the problems with same-sex marriage is that it makes marriage genderless. Because gender now doesn't mar matter to marriage. Well, if marriage is genderless, then children are incidental to marriage. And if children are incidental to marriage, then we're not teaching people through the law, and the law is a great teacher, that marriage is primarily to bring forth children. Now, I know some marriages don't, but that's the primary reason the government's involved, to bring forth children, to perpetuate and stabilize society. Homosexual relationships can't do that. Only heterosexual relationships can. Now, there's a lot more in the book there. But another thing you might ask them, Mike, is when they say something like that, 
you can ask them, well, what is your standard of morality? You're trying to impose a standard. Where are you getting it from? I'm getting it from the moral law written on the heart, the moral law that God has put on it, the moral law that began this country. Where are you getting it from? Because if there's no God, there is no objective morality. There is no objective right or wrong. Everything's a matter of opinion. All right. Yes, sir. How you doing? Good. How are you? Good. What's your name? Clay. Hey, Clay. So I have a. F I I believe that Jesus is God, and mm -hmm. um, I'm a Christian because of that. But a friend of mine who claims to be a Christian says that Jesus is just the Son of God, mm -hmm. and makes that like really stands on that like difference. And mm -hmm. so I argue from like John. And what he uses is he says, well, read God's words about Jesus' words about it. So in, uh, he specifically cites uh, Jesus' letter to the Laodiceans. And at the beginning of each of the letters, he's, Jesus assigns titles to himself or uses titles for himself. And the, for the Laodiceans, he says, this thing says the amen, the faithful and true witness. And then this is what he uses, the beginning of the creation of God. And so he uses the creation of God as a way to say, well, if Jesus is God, then how, why is he calling himself the beginning of the creation of God? Because then that, if he's created by God, then he can't be God. Or I guess that's his argument. Well, so, I'd, I'd have to go look at that passage and exegete it, but recall that in Colossians 1, Jesus is the creator of all things, right? Now, what the Jehovah's Witnesses will do is they will actually add a word to the Greek that isn't there, and instead of Colossians 1 saying Jesus created all things, it will say Jesus created all other things. And it's not in the Greek, and Greek scholars will say this is a complete distortion of the text, and even some Jehovah's Witnesses will admit it. Now, I wouldn't just, I, you know, we'd have to look at that, that passage you mentioned, but there are several other places that in a Jewish context, Jesus claimed to be God. Like, for example, uh, John 8, 58, where he says, before Abraham was born, I am. What's that a quotation from? That's a quotation from Exodus 3, 14, the burning bush. Remember when God appeared to Charlton Heston? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And Moses, Moses said to God, who should I tell the Israelites you are? God says, tell them I am sin. What does I am mean? I am means the self-existent eternal one. Jesus is claiming to be Yahweh there. That's why they picked up stones to stone him. And then, of course, uh, that happened on several occasions when they picked up stones to stone him because he is claiming to be God. In fact, they even say that. You were a mere man claiming to be God. And then, of course, at the, at the trial with the high priest before Caiaphas, you know, Charlie gave you the, uh, the archaeological evidence for Caiaphas, which is amazing. That, that, uh, that ossuary that Charlie says is in the Israel Museum, I've been there, and it's true. It's not behind glass or anything. It's just sitting there. It's amazing. You could actually touch it, but don't, because you ugly Americans will break it. Um, but um, uh, Caiaphas says, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? And, he, and Jesus said, I am, and you will see the, the, um, you will see, uh, the Son of Man on the clouds. And, and by the way, what's Jesus' famous or most popular designation for himself? The Son of Man. Not the Son of God. The Son of Man. What's the Son of Man? That's from Daniel 7. That's a God figure in Daniel 7. So in our book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, we go through several arguments for Jesus being God. Now, admittedly, he does so in a Jewish context. And he doesn't come right out and say it immediately, because if he did, they would have killed him immediately, and he wouldn't have been had the time to minister. So he had to play coy for a while. But when he was put under oath, he said, yep, right. and I'm God. Uh, what you reference where he says... Um, I am before Abraham. Well, he says, well, yeah, he's the beginning of the creation, so he was before Abraham. So he just uses that verse to reference other things and say, well, yeah, it's just because he was the first thing that was created. No, so it's like not really according to Colossians 1. Jesus created all things. Now, his human nature was created, but his divine nature wasn't. In fact, Jesus is several places in the Old Testament. Jesus is, is the pre-incarnate Jesus is in the temple in Isaiah 6, when Isaiah says, I saw the Lord in, his, in, in the temple. John 12 says that was Jesus. There's even two Yahwehs in Judges chapter 6. In other words, there's a plurality of Yahwehs because 
there's a trinity. So, uh, you know, I, I, I know that, I, I, first of all, I'd, I'd ask him, why are you trying to deny the divinity of Jesus? If Jesus isn't divine, then he can't be our savior. Well, he's, he's Catholic, so. He's what? He's Catholic, so it's. Oh, well, Catholics believe Jesus is divine. Yeah. Kind, kind of. <laughs> yeah, no, that Jesus is divine, the Trinity, they believe all that. In fact, Catholics believe in the essentials of the faith, just like Protestants. They disagree on certain areas, but Jesus being divine is not one of the things Catholic and Protestants disagree on. So I would ask him, how come you don't agree with the Pope? <laughs> all right, thanks. All right, thanks, Clay. Good afternoon, Dr. Turk. How you doing, sir? I'm doing well. My name is Matt. Um, I wanted to ask, how do you combat people that say um, every other religion in the world is going to hell besides Christianity? Well, first of all, I would ask them, it's not religions that are going to hell. It is people that are sinners that don't have the covering of Christ on them. And it might be better stated, what about those that have never heard, rather than uh, people saying, well, people who are other face don't come to, you know, don't, don't go to heaven. You don't, you don't go to hell because you disbelieve in Jesus. You go to hell because you've sinned. Just like you don't die because you didn't go to the doctor. You die because you have a disease. Now, maybe you could have prevented dying by going to the doctor, right? Just like you could prevent eternal death by going to the great physician, Jesus. But the reason people are going to hell is not because they haven't heard of Jesus. The reason people are going to hell is because they've sinned. Now, notice also that, that this particular objection is bringing up a moral issue. It's somehow claiming that God is immoral for not saving people who are not Christians. Again, where are you getting that moral standard from? You're, you're, you're stealing a standard from God to say that God is not moral. So the, the real question, it seems to me, is what about those that have never heard? Because for those that have heard and rejected, okay, that's their, that's their call. They don't, Jesus isn't going to force them into heaven against their will. For those that haven't heard, the question is, well, why haven't they heard? And we could go through a long answer to that, but let me give you the nub of the answer. In uh, Acts 17... Paul says, when he's preaching to the unbelievers on Mars Hill in Athens there, he says that, um, that God has um, arranged the times and places where people should live so that the people would reach out to God and find him because God is not far from any one of us. In other words, the cash value of this is this. We know that people who do hear the gospel many times don't accept it, right? I mean, there's people all over America that have heard the gospel and go, nope, not for me, right? It could be that people who never hear the gospel wouldn't have believed it anyway. Is that true? It could be, right? It could be that people who never hear the gospel wouldn't have believed it anyway. Of course, God knows. God knows if somebody were given this information whether they would believe or not. And God wants people to be saved more than we do. So there's not going to be anybody in the afterlife who, who's going to say, God, I got a raw deal here. If I had only known, right, I'd be up there with you. No, no. God is just, and nobody is going to wind up in a place that they were not, that they should not have been since God is just. He's infinitely just, and he's infinitely loving. He wants people to be saved more than we do. So while we can't uh, unpack all this or have all the answers for this, we know that since God is just, he is going to be just in the afterlife. He, so, people are either going to get justice or they're going to get grace. How do we come to terms with the fact that, let's say, for the Muslim religion that has billions of people worshiping something that, you know, we don't believe in, how do you come to terms with the fact that, you know, billions of people will go to hell? Well, there's maybe billions going to hell by their own free choice, and there may be billions going to heaven by their own free choice. Here's the question. Is God obligated not to create at all if some people freely choose to not trust in him? 
Is God obligated not to create at all if some he creates freely choose to reject him? You, as a parent, are you obligated not to have children because some of your children may reject you? No. You're not obligated to not have children because some don't want to follow you. I don't think God is under the same restraint either. God knows how things are going to turn out, but he gives people free will. And here's one thing even an all-powerful God can't do. He can't force free creatures to do what he wants them to do because that would be a contradiction. He can't force love. Just like you can't, you can't force your, your, the girl you like to, to love you. You can't. All you can do is give them free will and let them make their own choices. So, again, if we have moral objections to this, we have to keep in mind that we're assuming a moral standard in order to even bring the objection up. And that standard is what we mean by God. And, again, if God is just and he is loving, nobody in the afterlife is going to get a raw deal. And as you know, there's going to be different levels of punishment in hell, just like there's going to be different levels of reward in heaven, because that's what justice demands. Um, so... We, we, we trust God for the end result. And if we don't trust God, then we're assuming our own moral standard rather than his. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Hi, my name is Faith, and I have a question that I've always struggled with. Faith, hey, what kind of name is Faith? I mean, come on. <laughs> I didn't write faith, your sister's believe in everything. But anyway, it's okay. Um, my question is, is that um, our pastor here did a powerful um, sermon on Sunday about revelation. And um, something that I just don't understand, I've always struggled with ever since I became a Christian, is why would God create the Antichrist and, like, the Antichrist didn't get to decide that he's the Antichrist, you know? Does that make sense? Say the last sentence so, again, like, why, how did God choose who the Antichrist is going to be, and why didn't he give him the option of who the Antichrist is going to be? Like, why, like, it to me that doesn't sound like free will if the Antichrist didn't get to decide that he's going to be the Antichrist. Well, that's, <laughs> you, can ask that, you can ask that same question of any of us. Why did God create us, knowing that we would do evil? Yeah, but that's like, right? I don't know, that's just like, a huge deal like he's literally never going to be able to be a christian like he because he's the antichrist well okay but remember that when god elects to create the universe he knows how it's going to turn out right because he's all knowing he's outside of time he can see the end from the beginning but when he elected to create this universe he knew that you would believe because your name is faith no he knew that you would believe <laughs> And he knew that the Antichrist wouldn't believe, right? Or Satan wouldn't believe, or Richard Dawkins wouldn't believe, or whoever, right? But you're freely believing, and the Antichrist and Richard Dawkins and whoever else is freely not believing. Just because God knows what's going to happen doesn't mean he's taking people's free will away. Okay. We're still free. Just like you know when you put your baby to bed at night, you know that at some time during the night, the baby's going to wake up to want to eat. But because you know that, does that mean you're causing the baby to wake up? No. No. You're not caught. Just because you know it's going to happen doesn't mean you're causing it. The baby is freely waking up. And so when God creates this universe, he knows how it's going to turn out. Uh, but people are, he's not forcing people to, 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 to believe or not believe. That's up to them. Okay, that, yeah, that makes sense, because I've always struggled with him. Like, did he really get to decide if he's the Antichrist, you know? Sure he did. Yeah, he did. Um, just like Satan got to decide what he would do, and we got to decide what we would do. Right. Um, now, you say, well, why did God create a universe where people wouldn't believe? Well, it's logically possible God could create a universe where everyone believed, but it might not be actually achievable with free creatures. As I mentioned earlier, God can't force free creatures to do what he wants them to do. If they're free, they're free. So God created the uni a universe where the optimal number of people could be saved and the fewest number of people could be lost, and it, apparently it's this universe with free creatures. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Faith. 
Yes, sir. My name is Seth, and I'm asking a question for a good friend of mine. He says, do you have to observe the law and keep the law to be saved? And the reason he asks that is because he's an African-American gentleman, and he states that a lot of blacks who profess to be Christians are saying that. And then he also asks you, what is black liberation theology? Wow. Um, well, first of all, uh, actually uh, obeying the law, um, none of us can do that. Only Jesus has done that perfectly. That's why we put our trust in him. Now, if we could obey the law, then we wouldn't be in sin and we wouldn't need a savior. But all of us have sinned. And if we say we have it, we are actually lying. So we have. Uh, we have sinned. And that's why we need a savior. Now, black liberation theology, I'm no expert on, but basically it's more social gospel kind of stuff. It's how, ca how can we become um, unoppressed and how can we actually um, live a better life here and now? That's really what it's about more than what we would say the gospel is. See, in reality, there's no such thing as social gospel. Why? Because the gospel, God does it all. God provides the sacrifice. We don't do anything for the gospel. So there's no such thing as social gospel. The gospel God does. Justice on earth, we do. Or injustice, we do. So there's no such thing as social gospel. You can talk about social justice, okay? The problem is what social justice means now, it, 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 it used to mean, okay, we're going to take care of the poor, we're going to take care of orphans, we're going to take care of widows, we're going to take care of the unborn, right? Now it means... What we need to do is we need to overpower the oppressors. And that means anybody who is in a position of privilege in our society needs to be overpowered. And that includes um, people who are Christians because they are apparently the oppressors of any other religion. This is called critical theory, by the way which is a cancer, unfortunately. It's trying to solve a problem, but it's not the right way to solve a problem. Anybody who's white is an oppressor and a racist by definition. Any uh, heterosexual is an oppressor on the LGBT community, according to critical theory. Anybody who's wealthy is an oppressor on the poor. Um, anybody who is a citizen is an oppressor on immigrants. This is why people don't want walls. They don't want borders, okay? Um, anybody who is a Native um, American has been oppressed by the white man. This is what all critical theory teaches. So um, that's not biblical social justice. Biblical social justice is taking care of the poor, taking care of the orphans, taking care of the widows, taking care of the unborn, that kind of thing. But in our society, the term social justice now means all that critical theory stuff. That's why I don't use the term social justice, because it doesn't really mean what it used to mean. Thank you. And then one question I have for myself is, you know, in the past debating Jehovah Witnesses, when they get, you know, backed into the corner, I've had a lot of them just say, well, if hell is so real, then where is it? What would your answer to that be? I would ask them if the laws of logic are so real, where are they? <laughs> right. Or the, 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 uh, the moral ad admonition not to murder. Where is that moral ad adam? It's not a physical thing. It's an immaterial thing. Right now, there will be a physical place known as hell eventually. Uh, but right now, uh, when people die, they're either with the Lord or absent from the Lord. But when God creates the new heavens and new earth, heaven will be a physical place and we'll have physical bodies. And I assume hell will be the same kind of place. But, um, yeah, there's you don't ask where questions about spiritual issues. Because it's what we call in logic a category mistake. Where are the laws of logic? Well, they're not anywhere. They're in God's nature, but that's not aware. God's an immaterial being, right? Where is the color blue? Well, it's not aware. You know, where's where are the laws of mathematics? Well, it's not aware. It's you're asking a where question about an immaterial issue. Um, where was the man when he jumped off the bridge? He was on the bridge. No, that's before he jumped off the bridge. He was in the air. That's after he jumped off the bridge. Well, where was he? He was beside himself. I don't know. It's a, it's a stupid question. <laughs> right? So you got to be careful with, with the questions because sometimes they're actually questions that are bad questions because they violate a category of logic. Anyway, sir, go ahead. 
Hey, Dr. Torek, uh, this is uh, Cameron. Um, I have two questions for you. Yep. Um, the first one is, how did you come to want to do apologetics? Well, I came to faith through apologetics because um, I, uh, I was brought up Catholic. I went to Catholic high school, but I never knew who Jesus was. And it wasn't until I went into the Navy that I met the son of a Methodist minister. And I had so many questions for this guy. He finally said, you just need to get Josh McDowell books. Evidence demands a verdict and more than a carpenter. So I got those books and I read them. And I said, wow, Christianity's true. And then when I got out of the Navy, I ran into Norman Geisler. I was taking a class in apologetics at McLean Bible Church in D.C. And he came in to be the weekend uh, speaker. And I actually volunteered to put him up at my house. I didn't even know who he was. But at the time, he was kind of like the Michael Jordan of apologetics. And uh, he had started a seminary here in Charlotte, North Carolina. We were living up near D.C. And so when he invited us to come, we were within six months. We were here back in 1993. And so. I studied with him and wrote a couple of books with him. And so I got into apologetics that way. I came to faith through evidence, and that's why I was really attracted to it. Okay, cool. So the second one uh, would be for anyone wanting to do apologetics full time, what steps would you advise them to take and or resources? Oh, yeah, good question. What I would do, um, it depends on how much training they have already. If they already have a college degree, great. If they don't, then uh, go to college um, and uh, and uh, my school, Southern Evangelical Seminary, SES.edu, is here in Charlotte. But, you know, the world is virtual now. You don't have to move anymore. You can take classes from wherever you are. Um, and uh, you, I would take courses at SES.edu if you want a degree. If you don't want a degree, you can take courses from us um, at uh, crossexamine.org. I teach some of them. We have many other instructors. And um, you can learn that way. So I would highly recommend you start at some point. And the, the best time to start is always now, right? I mean, I didn't really start training in this kind of thing until I was 33 years old. I mean, I had, I had already spent time in eight years in the Navy, and then I really got involved in this. So um, you can start at any time. Moses started when he was 80, okay? So there's plenty of time. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, thanks, Cameron. Hi, Dr. Turk. Uh, my name's Greg. Pleasure to meet you. Um, I'm recent Good. to the apologetics world. Uh, just recently found uh, your organization cross-examined uh, maybe six months ago. I've uh, been listening on YouTube and whatnot. Um, my atheist friend <laughs> hit me with something I wasn't sure what to answer um, on uh, the famous book by Reza Aslan, Zealot. Uh, and he likes to go on these long diatribes where he tells me uh, all about my faith to my face for about an hour. Um, <laughs> and uh, how, how wrong I am in believing it, but hitting me with a lot of different things. Jesus was a Jew. He didn't do anything that he claimed in the Gospels, um, and that uh, he was a zealot, you know, everything that, you know, Aslan espouses. What would you say to that, and, you know, do you have any tips for dealing with that? Uh, I would not try and refute what he says. I would try and ask him to support what he says, right? When somebody says something, it's not your job to refute what they say. It's his job to support what they say. That's why, by the way, this book, I know that you may have heard of it, and if not, you need to, this book by Greg Kochel, Tactics. You guys have this book? I have heard you talk about it, yes, sir. Okay, if you don't have this book, get this book, Tactics, because it well, helps yeah. you um, interact with people on these issues. And one of the things the author, Greg Kochel, says is, look, if somebody says something, you don't have to refute it. They have to support it. So you've got to say, okay, well, first of all, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by zealot? Uh, second question, what evidence do you have for that position? Why do you think your position is right? I mean, you are basically saying the documents that were written 2,000 years ago uh, that, that have eyewitness testimony in, in them are wrong, and you're right now. Why? Why do you say that? What evidence do you have for that? And just see what he says. And when he's, when he's saying, well, my evidence is the book by, you know, Ph.D. Reza Aslan. What oh, well, there's a lot of Ph.D.s. You can get a Ph.D. to say anything. As George Will famously said, there's all sorts of different um, obscure and immoral activities that you can get a Ph.D. to agree with somewhere in America. Just because someone has a Ph.D. doesn't mean what they're saying is true. You have Ph.D.s who are saying the Bible's bunk, and you have Ph.D.s saying the Bible's true. So it's not the Ph.D. that will give you the truth. It's whether or not the evidence 
that both of those are citing is good. So uh, this guy that you're talking about, I believe, is a Muslim, isn't he? That's right. And he's also yeah. a uh, professor of uh, creative writing, not history. <laughs> so I okay, am aware yeah. of that. Well, there's another thing. You might say, okay, he, he may be telling the truth, but he's really not operating in his field. Because even skeptics like uh, Bart Ehrman will say Jesus certainly existed and Jesus certainly was crucified. Um, and uh, others, of course, will say he also rose from the dead. I was just watching an interview yesterday with uh, Dale Allison, who is a professor at Princeton Theological Seminary, who says, oh, yeah, Jesus rose from the dead. Yeah, he did. And he's not even an evangelical. He's just saying the evidence is there that he rose from the dead. Sometimes he doubts it. Sometimes he's not sure he's right. But, yeah, the evidence is he rose from the dead. Well, look, if Jesus rose from the dead, game over. Christianity's true, right? right. Um, so I would just ask him to really um, explain the evidence he has for his conclusions. And then you can have an opportunity to prevent some counter evidence. But just because a PhD says something doesn't necessarily mean squat, right? Thanks, Doc. Appreciate it. In fact, if a PhD says it, it might be it might be wrong. <laughs> thanks, Doc. Oh. All right, thanks. Hey, Frank. I'm Dan. Um, in a hey, world Dan. that is increasingly uh, hostile to Christianity, and now a government that many are saying in our country that is going to be increasingly hostile to Christianity, as we are marginalized, what is the best way for us? to engage the social justice thinking that you described earlier and for us to shine as, as the salt and light, to be the salt and light in the midst of this? Yeah, well, that's a big question. But one of the things I would highly recommend you do is to follow the advice of my friend Rod, Rod Dreher, who wrote the book, The Benedict Option, and a new book called Live Not By Lies. And the Live Not By Lies book, he's talking about how Russian dissidents who came from the Soviet Union are alarmed at the totalitarianism that is happening in America right now. It's not as much coming from the government as it is coming from corporate America and big tech, right? Yeah. That they are actually censoring people and they're canceling people. And, and, and his, um, his uh, recommendation to us is the same thing that saved Christians in the Soviet Union. And that is, right now, get organized into small groups. Get organized into small groups that you can ensure uh, that you'll have contact with when, dif when the difficult times really begin. And uh, you you're going to have to find alternative sources of media. We're trying at our website right now to come up with technology that will be uncensorable. Mm. And we're going to be unveiling that later this year in 2021 for crossexamine.org. We're going to create a, 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 a community behind a paywall just to keep the trolls out. It's not to make money or anything, just to keep people out who otherwise would be hostile so Christians can have a community uh, behind all that and we can stay in touch because as the world gets darker, we're going to have to find ways to do that. Praise in the meantime, I think you can just uh, be the salt and light in the culture as we always are and uh, look, as, as the world gets darker, these small groups, these small churches, they're going to become brighter and they're going to we're going to actually become, I think, more um, deep disciples of Christ by going through such difficulty. So the key point is get organized now, start start meeting, start finding ways to communicate when big tech makes it impossible to do so. You'll still be able to do so. Amen. Thank you, bro. Right. Thank you. Okay. Charlie will be on after lunch, and then you'll come on and do question and answer again after the okay. presentation. So after right. lunch, Charlie's on, or would you rather be on before him? No, whatever Charlie wants is fine. I, whatever. I don't care. Um, uh, but I'm supposed to do a thing on science at what time? Um, it, it's going to be 2.15. Uh, 2.15. Okay, well, I'll just be at 2.15. We'll just... Or my, do it at 2.15, and how about we do questions after that? Yeah, exactly. exactly. Okay. All right. So 2.15, I'll see you guys so, here, okay? Yeah, take a nap. All right, we'll see you. That's All good right. Okay. Let's get started. 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 Let's get